The Partnership for the Delaware Estuary presents its 2011 Science and Environmental Summit. This program was recorded January 31st, 2011 in Cape May, New Jersey. In this program, the opening session of the summit featuring keynote remarks from Department of Environmental Protection Regional Administrator Sean Garvin and U.S. Representative Frank Lobiondo of New Jersey's 2nd Congressional District. At the lectern to introduce the morning program is Jennifer Atkins, Executive Director of the Partnership for the Delaware Estuary. On behalf of the board and staff of the Partnership for the Delaware Estuary, our partners on the Science and Technical Advisory Committee, and our estuary program partners, the states of New Jersey, Delaware, and Pennsylvania, the Delaware River Basin Commission, the Philadelphia Water Department, and the Environmental Protection Agency in Regions 2 and 3, welcome to the 2011 Delaware Estuary Science and Environmental Summit. I'm Jennifer Adkins, Executive Director at the Partnership for the Delaware Estuary, and I'll be your MC for the morning. This is our fourth estuary-wide conference, uh, or summit, held every two years. Uh, and our theme this year, Connections, Land to Sea, Shore to Shore, and Science to Outreach, is once again reflective of the role that we seek to play as the National Estuary Program for the Delaware River and Bay, crossing sectors, and geographic boundaries and political boundaries to focus on protection of the estuary and its management uh, as a whole instead of in pieces. Uh, and this will be our most action-packed summit to date. We have over 130 different presentations over three days on topics ranging from science and research to restoration tools and practices and projects to policy and management, communications and education. Our activities over the next three days will be held here in the ballroom at the Grand Hotel, as well as on the fifth floor in the atrium, uh, where hopefully you've all been already to register and pick up your conference program, like this. Uh, but if you haven't been up to the fifth floor yet, if you could please uh, make your way up there, get registered, make sure to pick up your name tag so that the hotel folks know uh, that you're with us. Um, that would be great. It's on the fifth floor. Um, we also this year are piloting something a little bit new and different, and that's a simulcast. Uh, we're interested in trying to make the conference available to as many people as possible in the watershed uh, and always thinking about trying to reduce our carbon footprint. And so this year, uh, just as a pilot, we're simulcasting today's program, most of today's program, um, up to the Reading Area Community College. Uh, where we have some staff and some partners there um, who will be participating um, via live webcast. And so in your conference program, you'll find information about our schedule and our speakers for the next three days. You'll also find information about our sponsors, who together with the presenters, our staff members, and the partnership staff are really the ones responsible for making the summit happen. And so I'd like to thank all of them uh, and ask everyone to give all of those folks uh, a nice round of applause because <laughs> because our, with our, without our volunteer presenters, um, we really could not make a program like this happen. It's really what makes the conference uh, so great, having all those great presentations. And we have uh, a ton of them. So we're really packed in for the next few days and we're gonna do our best to keep us on schedule and to keep things moving. Uh, and we hope that you'll help us with that. Um, we are also fortunate this morning to have some special guests with us uh, to help us get the summit off to a great start. And uh, first of those, here to few, say a few words of welcome is Sean M. Garvin, who is the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency's Regional Administrator in Region 3, based out of Philadelphia. Mr. Garvin, along with his counterpart in Region 2 out of New York, is the top federal environmental official in the Delaware Estuary. Over his 20 plus year career in intergovernmental relations, Mr. Garvin has worked closely with congressional delegations, governors, state and local elected leaders and environmental agencies, as well as environmental citizen advocacy groups uh, throughout our region. And he's a native Delawarean. 
And we're very fortunate to have in Mr. Garden, Garvin an RA who uh, has a long history and a deep understanding of the importance of the Delaware Estuary and the important role uh, that the Estuary Program plays. So Regional Administrator Garvin, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Jen. Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the fourth biennial Delaware Estuary Science and Environmental Summit. If you had a chance to take a look at the agenda, you'll see that this promises to be a very full and meaningful three-day summit that encourages information exchange, creative solutions by the 250 participants. I credit the partnership for the Delaware Estuary, led by the very talented Jen Atkins and the equally talented partnership staff for bringing us all together. I also want to say hello to everybody up in Reading. I'm glad you could, enjoy, could join us, uh, and I hope that you can participate throughout the three days. I'd also like to, to acknowledge Congressman Frank Lobiondo uh, of New Jersey, and I understand at some point that New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection Commissioner Bob Martin will also be joining us on the agenda. My colleague, as mentioned earlier, Judith Ank, Regional Administrator from Region 2, sends her best regards and wishes for a successful summit. She unfortunately could not join us today, uh, but her commitment to restoring the estuary uh, is, is there along with all of ours. The Delaware Estuary is one of 28 estuaries regarded by Congress and EPA as having national significance and is on, the only tri-state estuary program in the National Estuary Program. No matter what side of the Delaware Estuary you call home, we all recognize its tremendous value as a source of drinking water for millions of people, the role its tidal marshes and other resources play in providing critical habitat for fish, birds, and other organisms, its economic driving force is having the largest freshwater port system in the world, its recreational benefits, and its sheer beauty. I must say that it's refreshing and inspiring to see many of you here at this important summit. Your presence speaks volumes about your commitment and desire to collaborate on ways to improve the estuary's water quality and habitat areas, which in turn creates healthier communities where people value their local waterways and feel connected to them. The summit's theme appropriately defines one of the most important tasks we must accomplish if we succeed in protecting and restoring this jewel. Connections, land to sea, shore to shore, and science to outreach. This theme may mean different things to different people, but here's what it means to me. First, we must redouble our efforts on work, working together to ensure that all of the activities taking place throughout the watershed connect to ways to achieve the best possible outcome for people and the environment. Two, that we will all commit to a better job of informing local communities about the work taking place to restore and protect their waterways while getting them engaged in these efforts so they understand the value of natural resources environmentally and economically and what they can do to protect them. And three, we continually seek those connections that foster synergy between innovation and research, education and outreach, and communication and collaboration. All of these efforts are key tools in the access of raising national awareness for the unique qualities and environmental importance of the Delaware Estuary. Many, many of the participants at this summit play some role in making these connections. As a lifelong resident of this watershed and as regional administrator, I am committed to educating and engaging the people, groups, and public servants that impact and are impacted by the estuary, and I challenge you all to do the same. The Delaware Estuary, home to five million people, is a vital ecosystem facing a number of environmental challenges. Through the efforts of the Partnership for the Delaware Estuary, public and private organizations, corporations, volunteer citizens groups, and many other renowned academic in institutions, we are all taking action to minimize the threats to the system and identify innovative solutions to the challenges. At EPA, we're providing support to these on the ground and locally driven efforts. Annually, we award Clean Water Act grant money to the partnership. This year we awarded $800,000, which is matched dollar for dollar with non-federal re resources. With this annual seeding, 
seed funding, the partnership has successfully leveraged more than $18 million in fiscal year 2010 with other collaborators and has restored and protected about 1,600 acres of the habitat. EPA support extends beyond basic program funding. For instance, to better understand the impacts of climate change, we provided financial and technical assistance to the partnership through our Climate Ready Estuaries Initiative to undertake the first ever study of the potential vulnerabilities of the Delaware Estuary. Since 2008, the Partnership for the Delaware Estuary has engaged experts from around the region to identify and assess these vulnerabilities. They focus their attention on three key resources, tidal wetlands, drinking water, and bivalve sailfish, and set out to, to determine how these resources might be impacted by climate change and how best to adapt to those changes to ensure these resources remain resilient. I commend the partnership and those who support this climate change adaptation study and look forward to working with you all to implement the recommended strategies to sustain these much needed resources. This is a huge accomplishment given the size and complexity of the system. Another, another notable achievement deserving mention is the Partnership's Alliance for Comprehensive Ecosystem Solutions. The alliance exemplifies the theme, of the, the theme of the summit and that has brought together leadership from the private sector with the leadership of the partnership from the Delaware Estuary Steering Committee, comprised of EPA, the states of Delaware and New Jersey, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, the Delaware River Basin Commission, which under the leadership of Carol Collier has played an invaluable role in their efforts, and the city of Philadelphia. The alliance works to promote improved coordination of restoration of the Delaware Estuary. Through the alliance, these diverse partners are focusing joint efforts on the problems needing the most attention to ensure the most meaningful environmental outcomes are realized. I'd like to highlight a particular person who has been instrumental in getting the alliance up and running. That is Mike McCabe, former Mid-Atlantic Regional Administrator and a strong supporter of the work we're doing here in the Delaware Estuary. Mike commits his time, leadership, and environmental passion, and we appreciate all that he does. Last year, with the support of esteemed scientists, the Alliance identified five projects as the most important to promote and support for protecting and enhancing the Delaware Estuary. These projects include work to restore urban shoreline, urban shoreline along the Delaware River and Bridesburg area of Philadelphia, restoration of the portion of Mill Creek in Newcastle County, Delaware, the strategic placing of clam, clean clamshells in the Delaware Bay to enhance, enhance recruitment and rebuild abundance of oysters, reforest, reforesting areas throughout the basin and restoring 15 acres of riparian habitat on the property of a Salem County manufacturer. In addition to these first selected projects, future ones submitted to the partnership's project registry can be matched up with funding or partnership opportunities. The registry serves as a useful purpose because any organization needing funding can submit a project and any entity wanting to provide funding or partner on a specific project can identify one by checking the registry. As I mentioned earlier, the Delaware Estuary is, a, is valued for, among other reasons, its economic driving force is the largest freshwater port system in the world. And while it serves this major role as part of the important transportation system, we must not overlook its, extent, its existence as a living resource. Reconnecting people to their urban waterways is one of EPA's key initiatives. Healthy and accessible urban waters can help grow local businesses, enhance educational, recreational, and social opportunities in the community. EPA has launched its Urban Water Initiative to help communities, especially underserved communities, to access, improve, and benefit from their urban waters and surrounding land. By more effectively using existing programs, we can work with a variety of federal, state, tribal, and local partners to foster increased connection, understanding, and stewardship of local waterways. Last year, EPA joined the partnership, the Delaware Center for the Inland Bays, the Maryland Coastal Bays Program, and other state and local partners in launching Rain Gardens for the Bay, a regional campaign for greening neighborhoods and improving water quality in our local streams and bays. This campaign promotes the use of rain gardens as a way that individual citizens, businesses, schools, and others can help control stormwater runoff. It's an easy, less costly, and proven way that communities can take part in the environmental stewardship that will re reap environmental and health benefits for years to come. 
With the partnership's help and through funding and technical assistance from the state of Delaware and local sponsors, we have installed over 12 demonstration rain gardens since the kickoff in the fall of 2010 and hope to increase the number in 2011. I congratulate all the partners involved in launching this project, particularly Kathy Bunning Howard and her staff at DENREC for funding through its non-point source program. Just recently, there was an article in the Philadelphia Inquirer about a major biological find in the Delaware River area of Philadelphia. This article highlighted hard work and perseverance of the Partnership Science Director, Danielle Krieger, who last year discovered a native species of freshwater mussels in the river believed to have been locally extinct. In addition to that great find, I also want to thank Danielle for her leadership and vision in making this summit a reality. This discovery shines a bright light on the potential vibrance of the river and the mussels themselves. It should also serve as a message to all of us that work we're doing is not in vain and that we must remain committed to restoring the Delaware estuary so that future generations will not only enjoy its natural beauty and value, but honor and protect it as a treasured, treasured resource. Again, I thank you for the invitation to address you today. I wish you success over the next three days of the summit, and I look forward to continuing to work and collaborate with all of you. Thank you. Thank you for those wonderful words about the partnership and highlight doing such a nice job of highlighting some of our recent efforts. Um, we, we have lots of opportunities here at the conference over the next couple days to hear more about some of those things, whether it be our project registry, which is part of a larger regional restoration initiative, um, also the Alliance for Comprehensive Ecosystem Solutions. We have a poster presentation upstairs on that. Um, and certainly you're going to hear more about mussels and shellfish restoration over the next few days. So um, we've got an, an action-packed agenda that will include all of those things. Um, and I think, you know, one of the things that has occurred to me as I talk with people here at the conference, including Regional Administrator Garvin uh, and Representative Lobiondo, and looking at their bios and thinking about all of the people who are here today, is that as we work to uh, move beyond jurisdictions and cross state boundaries and political boundaries and uh, geography, um, it occurs to me that all of us doing this important work do that in our everyday lives. Most of us have, whether we're a native, <clears throat> excuse me, native Delawarean, as I am, John is, um, or whether you're a native New Jerseyan or native Pennsylvanian, it's very likely that you vacation in the shore in New Jersey, or you vacation in the shore at the beach in Delaware, um, or you uh, have family in Philadelphia. And we all move across these boundaries regularly, uh, as do all of the, um, maybe not the plants, but the animals certainly that live here, and the water that goes through here. And so we're all uh, kind of microcosms um, of that need to continually cross those boundaries. But um, it's been interesting to me as I meet, everyone I meet in the Delaware Estuary has stories about multiple states and multiple places. And I think that's the reality of our region. Um, and certainly holding the summit once again in, a in the beautiful seclusion of Cape May in winter uh, gives us that wonderful feeling of, uh, of a retreat with almost 300 of our closest and most dedicated colleagues. And I can't tell you what a thrill it is for us at the partnership on our staff. Uh, to have these three days of working with you all. Um, here to say a few words of welcome also for us is the man who represents the people of Cape May and the Delaware Bay Shores of New Jersey in the United States Congress, Representative Frank A. Lobiondo. Um, he is a native of New Jersey. Uh, he was born in Cumberland County and today resides in Atlantic County. He has been a tremendous supporter of the National Estuary Program and the Partnership for the Delaware Estuary's work. And he understands how important the Delaware Estuary is to the people of this region and to our economy. So Representative Lobiondo, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Jennifer, and good morning. Uh, welcome every way to every everyone to uh, beautiful Cape May. Um, if you like snow, I hope you get it. If you don't like snow, I hope it bypasses you. Uh, 
I'm personally a little sick of it at this point, but uh, congratulations on the outstanding work that you're doing, and I know the outstanding conference that you will be having. A very special um, congratulations to Jennifer for the outstanding work that she continues to do uh, in a critically important area. You heard some of the particulars, and I want to thank Administrator Garvin for being here today and for the work that the EPA is doing in partnering with you. Um, whatever the challenges have been up to this point, I think they will almost pale in comparison to what we will be facing here in the future. Um, Washington has enormous problems that we are going to attempt to get our arms around. And something that um, Jennifer said is what will be key in all of this. Uh, how will we be able to cross the political boundaries? How will we be able to cross the geographic boundaries and find common ground for solutions that are so critically important? Uh, a number of things that I'm going to attempt to work on. Last year, I co-sponsored with Congressman Tim Bishop the Clean Estuaries Act, which would be the reauthorization of the National Estuaries Program. It's critically important. I really thought we had a good chance of getting it done last year. We're going to try to regroup and to find a legislative strategy that will get us a final product that will be successful uh, so that that can aid in the work that you're doing and the other estuaries are doing. Um, but I have to tell you that your involvement, your focus, your participation, as I mentioned just a couple of minutes ago, is going to really be critical. Um, we're running $4 billion a day higher into the deficit every single day, $4 billion. This year, the deficit's going to be about a trillion and a half dollars overall. It is unsustainable for our nation for everything that you and I hold near and dear and believe in, to stick our head in the sand and believe that we can go on with this, and as long as the government does it somewhere else, it's okay. Now, I don't know where this is all going to come down, um, but the president, congressional leadership, I promise to be working together. So what this all means, I think, as hard as you've worked before, and as smart as you have worked before, it will mean working a little bit harder and working a lot smarter to find these partnerships that can give us, point us, bring us to the goals that we all want and do it within a framework that we're going to be forced to live within. I don't know how these numbers are going to come down. Uh, I don't know what the ultimate result's going to be. I don't think anyone does. But I can just tell you it'll be extremely challenging. So whichever state you're from, whichever region you're from, whatever groups you partner with, make sure that your representatives in Washington clearly understand your focus, your attention, your commitment, your dedication, your passion for being successful in this particular area. Those who ignore that approach, I feel, are going to suffer a very negative consequence. I know that won't be the case, Jennifer, with you and with the partnership and with many of you in this room. Um, and I don't like to be the bearer of um, sort of uh, negative tidings, but it's reality that we're living with it. And while we want to see the successes, we have to understand exactly how we bring these together. I grew up just a few miles away from the Delaware Bay. Uh, one of the projects that was uh, very successful, is very successful, uh, the Oyster Restoration Project. I was very pleased to see in the lobby uh, a lot of references to that. Um, for those of you who may not be aware, uh, the Bayshore uh, Discovery Project really does a great job of highlighting uh, what it is we're doing today and what the history was um, not all that long ago, where it was the oyster capital of the world. Uh, the photographs are remarkable. The economic impact, uh, the benefit to the area, the environmental positive impact, all tremendous. And because of the work of many of you in this room and the partnership, um, we have made tremendous strides in helping to restore. Now, I was uh, involved with some of the federal monies that were coming in to help restore this. Um, they're now a dirty word called earmarks. 
Uh, I happen to think that if earmarks are fully transparent and the cost-benefit analysis is clearly seen, then they have to be considered. But if you can generate uh, the enormous numbers for every federal dollar, you've got 50 private dollars coming out of this. Uh, you've got a situation that we ought to pay attention to. And the idea is to become self-sufficient. I don't think anybody wants to see any government, federal government or state government, involved on an ongoing basis when we can reach a point of being self-sufficient. That's what the whole idea is of working with projects like this that can be a tremendous benefit, tangible benefit, to so many people in our area and have a positive win-win situation. So I want to congratulate you for the great job that you've been doing. Jennifer, I encourage you to uh, keep everybody motivated. I know you will. Uh, thank you for the invitation to be with you today, and good luck with all you're doing in the future. I'll try to remain a strong partner with you. We are, believe it or not, uh, a little bit ahead of schedule. So I have asked Representative Lobiando and Regional Administrator Garvin if they might be interested in taking a few questions. Um, so I guess if I could ask them both to maybe come up to the mic and then um, I'll do my best to uh, identify the questions and maybe speak them as loudly as possible. Any questions? I know I just put people on the spot. Rachel? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. In the President's address uh, last week, he emphasized the importance of science and technology to get the American economy going again. Um, I'm with the U.S. Geological Survey Science Agency. EPA has the Office of Research and Development. From a congressional standpoint and from the, uh, the national economy standpoint, what's the future for science and scientists to support estuary science? over the next couple of years under these uh, budget conditions? Well, from the congressional perspective, uh, I think that's one of the big questions that remains to be answered. Unfortunately, um, last year, the whole budget and appropriation process was suspended. Um, we don't need to get into the reasons for it. It's just, it is what it is. And that's why next week we're going to have to be facing a an extension of a continuing resolution, uh, which you're in a, if you're in a government agency, it's not a good position to be in, where you're not sure of what your funding's going to be for the balance of this fiscal year. Uh, but I really like the idea of the president raising that level of awareness. Uh, basing our decisions on sound science is critically important. It's essential. It's critically important. And, and having the ability to develop that science through all the processes that lead to getting to that point in, uh, the, you know, in, in, the, in the road we travel along is important. But how is it going to work on a budgetary standpoint? I don't know. I can tell you that in this Congress, in this session of Congress, that there'll, there'll be a budget and there'll be a full appropriation process. And that means that each of the 12 appropriation committees will have subcommittees with full hearings. Uh, at the committee level, there'll be full hearings. And each one of the appropriation bills will be with what's called an open rule, meaning anyone can suggest almost anything when it reaches the floor of the House of Representatives. So as this process begins to unfold, and I think you will see it March, April, May time frame, uh, the particular area of interest that you may have with any aspect of the federal budget and the appropriation process is the time for you to weigh in. Now, uh, increases, I think, will be few and far between. Uh, I hope it's not an across-the-board type of thing, but we can have the ability to separate where there might be waste, where there might be opportunity for savings, and clearly there have to be, uh, against those areas which are doing a really good job and deserve to be recognized for it. So, Thanks. I'm, I'm going to kind of answered a little differently. Um, everything we do at the EPA, our basic tenet of the way we approach everything is based on sound science and the basis of law. Um, don't quote me on this, but I believe next to NASA, EPA has the largest group of 
scientist in, in kind of the, the generic form than anybody. And, and that's, that's kind of how we enter this conversation of, of the economy and, and revitalization. And, and when we talk about the estuary, um, you know, every activity, be it wetlands development or um, going out there and, and, and trying to improve water quality, um, has some kind of driving force in, in the economy. And so the more, as a congressman was saying in his remarks, the more that we can, can leverage funding and the more that we can work together and build off of each other, uh, I think the, the better off we're going to be in one, protecting the estuary, and number two, helping to create uh, a more viable economic uh, situation in the Delaware estuary area. Uh, my name is Bob Tudor, and I'm with the Delaware River Basin Commission. And we were working with Congressman Castle over in Delaware on uh, a restoration strategy for the Delaware system that maybe paralleled some of the kind of things that happened in the Chesapeake and uh, the uh, Hudson systems. And we still look forward to doing that and would like to work with you, Congressman Labiando, if, if you were inclined uh, in terms of trying to figure out a strategy of how to pick that up and get it moving again. You mentioned the Clean Estuaries Act, but this was one that was more locally focused on how we can manage from the mountains to the sea and, and do something that is uh, of similar profile to some of these other big estuaries. Sure, I, I, would, be, uh, I would be happy to. I uh, worked for a number of years very closely with, with Mike Castle. Uh, I won't make a political comment about what happened, but um, when we are successful regionally, um, even though it's my view, you know, if it's, a, if it's a, like a purely Delaware project, but we're successful with it, that gives us the ability to be successful on a, on a broader basis. If we're successful with the Chesapeake, we're successful with a project in Delaware, it means we can be successful with the Delaware Bay. It means that we learn from our successes, we learn from those partnerships, and when we form those partnerships, we strengthen our ability to get good things done. So I would be very happy, um, you know, have someone, I'll give you a card, or I'm easy enough to get in touch with, let us know how we can partner in and help, and I'd be very happy to. Um, Mary Leck, Ryder University, could, will you comment on the fracting in the upper parts of the Delaware River um, and how that will impact water quality. It's kind of hoping you were looking for the legislative answer to, to that question. Um, you know clearly hydrofracking is kind of an emerging uh, thing in this part of the part of the region something that is has gone on in other parts of the country but the uh, Marcellus Shale formation uh, which is actually impacts uh, both um, Region 3 and in Pennsylvania and parts of uh, West Virginia and, and Virginia as well as uh, into New York is, is kind of an emerging issue that, that we are uh, in the process of kind of figuring out what role the federal government as a whole plays and, and particularly uh, what role uh, the EPA plays in it. Um, there's a number of um, uh, exemptions that this industry has under the Clean Water Act and so uh, we're currently figuring out how do we address and deal with those exemptions uh, as well as making sure that that uh, we have an effort to uh, protect the, the various natural resources. Uh, I can tell you that the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania has done a, has done a lot over the last year or so uh, and from a, a state perspective in trying to, uh, to address that issue and we have been supporting them through that effort. Uh, we currently have a hydrofracking drinking water study going on uh, at the EPA uh, to get a better feel and a better determination on how that fracking uh, operation uh, may impact drinking water. Um, and so we're working through that and, and working in collaboration with our states to kind of figure out where we move forward uh, with hydrofracking. I'm a and I uh, was just wondering, uh, Mr. Garvin, I, I heard on NPR recently that um, uh, President Obama was going to ask for some sort of regulatory review of, of, of various regulations, where your um, uh, region is with that and, and what your thoughts are on that, on that overall review. Well, you know, if we're talking about regulatory reform uh, regulation process, it's, it's, a, it's a one EPA discussion. It's not a region by region discussion. Um, you know, 
I'm a firm believer, the agency's a firm believer that there's always a better way to do something and, and if you kind of stop looking at what you have in front of you and just kind of uh, rest on your laurels, um, you know, you're not going to make, make progress. Uh, and so we as an agency are going back and looking uh, at kind of a regulatory structure in some areas and, and some of it, um, you know, we obviously have a number of things that are going on that, that is also uh, bolstering where we are uh, in some areas as it, as it relates to, to reg regulations. And so um, we're going to be um, working as an agency and working with uh, the administration to figure out are, are there better ways that we can approach uh, regulation and still protect uh, human health in the environment. Uh, Congressman uh, Lobiondo, I, I have a question about the overall budget situation, I guess. And, you know, I'm, I'm worried that programs like this are going to be targeted for some pretty heavy cuts. My question is, why has President Obama exempted our military spending from reduction? Uh, we currently have, by one, one estimate, at least 900 military bases overseas. Our military expenditures are the equal of all the next 25 nations' expenditures combined. And it seems to me we can't really afford this. And I'm just wondering if you could give some perspective as to why the military expenditures have been exempted. And it might come down very heavily on the area of, say, environmental protection. Well, I don't think anything in this session of Congress is going to be exempted. I don't know what that means for the programs that will be near and dear to your heart, but I think there's an acknowledgement that the problems are so severe and we are in such a crisis that if the military was exempt before, they're not exempt now. So they're going to be, you know, if you break this down, you can, your, your head can spin right off your shoulders with how these numbers, uh, what they mean and the reality that discretionary spending and non-discretionary spending and entitlement spending and what happens with Medicare and Medicaid and Social Security, uh, you know, when, you, when you've got a proposal that will change the retirement age for people who are under 40 from, you know, by two years and you've got people out there criticizing it, they, they're looking for the program to just go belly up. I mean, there's going gonna, gonna to have to be an acknowledgement here that if, if you want some of these programs in the future, uh, there's going to be have to have a common sense and a consensus approach to get to how we make a difference. The military cannot be exempt. You, I, I'm on the Armed Services mit, Committee. You can't convince me that there is not a more efficient way for them to be operating. And as we run through uh, government reform and oversight, there, there's a reason why in each session of Congress uh, you can look at it afterwards and say, well, you know, Maybe they should have done this or should have done that. So we won't try to go back over the last two or four years, but one of the responsibilities of Congress is oversight. And we've not done a good job with a lot of different areas. And having the military and the Pentagon come in and answer what they're doing and why they're doing it and how they're doing it, and, and I'll tell you, the answer for them in slashing across the board is not the right approach for them either, just like it's not the right approach for programs that you may be concerned about. There may be quality of life issues with men and women in uniform who have their putting their lives on the line for us as we speak that should be sacrosanct and maybe there's something to do with a defense contractor uh, that we need to look at where the savings can come from. But that's hard work. The easy thing is to make the cut across the board and say okay everybody's going to suffer equally in the pain. But I don't think you get at the real root of the problem when you do it that way. So you've got to go through and really understand what is working Where's the cost-benefit analysis? And if we're spending a dollar on an estuary program and getting 50 bucks back, you know, that's a pretty good hint. We maybe ought to not cut that. And if you're spending $50 and getting 20 back, maybe that's a pretty good idea that that's an area that we ought to, we ought to get to. So this is going to be a whole new ball game of what happens over these next six months. And uh, I, I'm not sure how it's all going to come together, except we have been assured repeatedly and the Speaker of the House of Representatives did so yesterday on national television, saying that any idea that's put forward will have a 
fully open debate and a fully open vote on the floor of the House. So that means 435 people will be deciding what happens. And that's where individual groups make a difference, making sure that your representative of Congress knows how you feel. Sorry, that was a long answer to a short question. We maybe have time, I think, for one more. OK, maybe we'll do two more. I'll go Danielle and then Matt. You both referenced the Oyster Project. And last year, uh, the Delaware Bay Oyster Restoration Project received the Corporate America Award, a national award, for its uh, excellent success. And um, looking to the future, we've, we, we're at a point of, of not being able to sustain that through the earmarks that have come through in the past. As we look across to the Chesapeake in the executive order, we're aware that the numbers uh, just for oyster investment alone are in the billions of dollars. I'm not sure of the fate of that, looking at the hard, tough times in the future. But it's hard for us not to feel in the Delaware estuary that uh, is sort of a have and have not situation when one tenth of one percent of the levels being discussed for the Chesapeake would probably pro provide a sustainable fishery and all the uh, environmental benefits of a sustainable oyster fishery in, in Delaware Bay. Do you have any advice? We, we, we're always mulling around, should we be linking up with the Chesapeake because the CND Canal, the two estuaries are connected, or should we be trying to continue to educate folks in Washington about the significance of the Delaware estuary in and of itself? I mean, how should we try to elevate the profile of this system for all of its treasures? <clears throat> Using the oysters as an example. I think all of the above. I think assuming whatever worked or provided any degree of success in the past as to what to build on is maybe OK, but probably very faulty thinking. You're going to have to think outside of the box. You're going to have to think creatively. You're going to have to think of how you can perform the partnerships, uh, form the partnerships that will make a difference, and, and how to be more effective in communicating what you just said. I mean, I, I, I hear it, I understand it, I believe it. Uh, but when you, when you get into the kind of tough decisions we're going to get into, I, I think that being in a partnership is going to offer a better opportunity, uh, along with having people understand. Um, having and continuing to be a resident and a lifelong resident of the Delaware Estuary. Um, I've been kind of connected to this whole effort for a very long time and, and I've been with the agency uh, since 1997 and one of the very first things I did at the agency was go uh, to a steering committee meeting with uh, Mike McCabe uh, back when we used to refer to it as DELAP. Um, and you know I think the struggle has always been the this whole idea of the not the people in this room, but kind of everybody else looking at the Delaware River and the Delaware Estuary as kind of part of the transportation system and not as much about its uh, unique and significant value to uh, to the environment and to public health and, and uh, you know, recognizing the economic side of it from port and boat traffic, but not necessarily the other economic uh, benefits that you can derive from the Delaware Estuary. Um, I don't see that public dollars are going to be increasing for anything uh, anytime soon. So our ability to leverage uh, funding that's out there, both public and private, and not uh, be duplicative in our efforts, building on the various efforts, I think is, is certainly one thing that's going to be a benefit uh, to this program and to our efforts uh, on the Delaware Estuary. Um, but I think the biggest key is, is education. And that, can I think, is where you all are, are trying uh, immensely hard. And sometimes it's difficult for us to to get traction. Um, I mean, even when you have the labeling, the storm sewer labeling, and not everybody necessarily, when they see that, make a connection uh, to the bigger estuary uh, system. It may be their local creek or, or whatever that feeds into the estuary. Um, and I think our ability to continue uh, to communicate, rose, raise the profile, I'm committed uh, from the EPA's perspective um, of engaging, helping to lead the other kind of public entities in, in, in our involvement in the estuary um, approach and, and uh, restoration. And, and I think that that right now is kind of where, where we're going to be. 
Um, and I think that that's what's going to ultimately benefit us is, is the more people we can get engaged, the more people who, from a resource standpoint, can step up, but more individuals who are doing what they can do on an everyday basis to help um, improve and, and protect the estuary, I think, is, is what our future is. And um, I think today um, there's a great example of the commitment that's here, and, and I think building off of this um, conversation, um, taking it to the public, um, and getting more and more traction is, is uh, ultimately um, what's going to benefit this effort. Last one. Congressman Lobiondo, you've been instrumental in helping the Cape May Gref Refuge expand by something like uh, 800 acres and bringing in something like almost $39 million over the, last, over the last several years to help grow the refuge into an ecological whole. But like many refuges in New Jersey, uh, ours is a fairly young refuge and still has to expand by about 10,000 acres that Congress has said is necessary to, to fill the project boundaries for the refuge. Right now we have unprecedented opportunities to uh, acquire some tracks that have been long sought, sought to tie together thousands of acres along the Cape May Peninsula. And I'm just wondering, with the issue of earmarks and the uncertainty of efforts to secure permanent funding for the Land and Water Conservation Fund dollars. Uh, what, what you might have to offer um, in terms of what we can do to help assure that some of that money gets to acquiring some of these, these key instrumental tracks. Pray. <laughs> uh, I don't mean to make light of a serious situation. Matt, you've, you've been just fabulous, and we've worked together for a long time. And the kind of work that you have done with the other partners will have to be dramatically increased. I, I don't know. I mean, there's an earmark ban. That is in place. Is Now, what may change? There's supposed to be a review of how we can make this fully transparent and uh, fully answerable to the American people, so the bridge from Bridge to Nowhere and other nonsensical projects uh, that we all shake our heads at don't get funded again with taxpayer dollars. I mean, you know, for years we only laughed about the earmarks that, you know, put funding to determine why, you know, blackbirds like sunflower seeds. And now, now we're all paying for that with uh, very qualified projects that have suffered, but people said enough is enough. Now, I don't know whether that review and that uh, reform will be six months or a year, but while that's in place, the only funding that's going to come down, from what I can see, is through the administration. So if the administration sends a budget to Congress that includes a line item for fill in the blank, then Congress has to work that through, but it's not likely Congress is going to be adding a lot of things in at least not in this current climate. So I'm very concerned. We've made a lot of progress, but as Matt indicated, we have such enormous opportunity uh, to be able to do some things that will last for generations and generations and generations to come. But Matt, I don't, I don't know. Uh, maybe in a couple of months we'll have a better idea. The president presents his budget when the committees start to meet. Uh, and as always, I'm uh, going to be thrilled to work with you and have your ideas. Uh, you've you bring an enormous amount of energy, positive energy, to the table, and I thank you for it. Well, I would just like to thank you both so much for, I know you weren't expecting to take questions, and so you've um, just been great sports, and I think we've had some really interesting questions and some dialogue here today. So, um, and thank you once again for joining us today at the conference. I hope. Thanks to you. We hope you enjoyed this presentation by the Partnership for the Delaware Estuary. For more information, visit DelawareEstuary.org or call 800-445-4935. We produce this program in the studios of Professional Podcasts in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, on the web at professionalpodcasts.com.
for everyone at the Partnership for the Delaware Estuary, this is Steve Lubetkin. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you out there on the net. Take good care.